after planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham and Sheffield in the United Kingdom and in Lusaka, Zambia, we invite you to El Shaddai Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. We meet as a church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, call us on 713-780-0600. Email houston at elshaddaitoday.com or log on to our website at www.elshaddaitoday.com. Come and discover your destiny and enter into the realm of possibility. Somebody say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Now, what is the curse of the law? The curse of the law can only be determined in terms of its definition by going back to the law to find out what the word says the, the curse of the law was. Now, the expression, the law, as it is found in the New Testament, always refers either to the Ten Commandments or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Either the Ten Commandments or the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. So every time you find the phrase, the curse of the law, you must realize is referring to either the Ten Commandments or the Pentateuch. Now, in reading the Ten Commandments, it is well established, even non-believers know the Ten Commandments, that in the Ten Commandments there is no curse. So if we are to determine what the curse of the law is, we have to go back and read the first five books of the Bible to understand what the curse of the law is. So here we go. Number one, the curse of the law is the second death. For God told Adam, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And we will see a lot of that in detail during this week. And when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the scripture says he died. Now, don't get the idea that death is the cessation of the physical body. No, death in its essence is separation from God. For notice, the day that Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he died, but it took him 930 years later to literally lay his body to the dust. But he already died. So the curse of the law, number one, is the second death. Number two, the curse of the law. As we read, particularly Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in Verse 15, and the curse is enumerated in great detail. You begin to find out that, that, that the curse of the law constituted poverty and lack. Before the fall, man was abundantly supplied. And the scripture says part of the curse of the law is going out, working so hard, and, and coming back with little. Before Adam fell in the garden, he was commanded to work, but not to toil. The, the, he did not gather his food by the sweat of his brow. He had to work, and that's why even when you are a believer, you have to work. That's why the best working people must be Christians. Instead of having your prayer meetings that last throughout the lunch hour and 10 minutes more. Hello, somebody. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You should be the best workers right there at Barclays or Northwest or wherever you work. Why? Because, because you understand that work gives you an ability to maximize the expression of your God-given potential. But, but before Adam fell, he worked but didn't have to sweat. There was no toil in it. And I'm trying to tell you, this week, there's going to be an anointing in this house that releases over you that potential once again to go back to the realm of sweatless victories. <laughs> Let me say it again. There's going to be an anointing released in this house from this pulpit by men and women of God as they preach the word of God. It will take you back to the realm of sweatless victories. 
Do you receive that today? Come on, give the Lord your best shout if you receive that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thirdly, the curse of the law constituted sickness and disease. Actually, when you read Deuteronomy 28, you begin to notice that there are 11 sicknesses and diseases enumerated in, in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 28. And you begin to notice in chapter, in verse 61 through to uh, 65, he begins to say, even every curse that's not written in this book of the law, calling it the book of the law, he says it's under the curse. So sickness and disease is a product of the curse. Somebody said, well, God made me sick. God can't make you sick. Well, you know, God made me poor. God can't make you poor. No, you don't need a covenant to be poor. You can do that pretty good by yourself. You don't need God to make you sick. You don't need a covenant to be poor. The, the Bible gives you a perfect recipe of how to be poor. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the arms, and suddenly poverty will come upon you like an armed man. Notice poverty was not denounced or was not discussed as a blessing. It was called a bandit, a thief. That robs you. It robs you of dignity. It robs you. They line you up in a soup line. And every time they have to increase your, 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 your allowance this week, they talk to you like you're a dog. Hello, somebody. And here is the deal. Now you're redeemed from that. So you're redeemed from dying young, call the undertaker, call the funeral director, get your expenses back. You are still here. Tell your cousins, don't get used to me living broke, busted, and disgusted, sharing one room with you. I'm on my way to my wealthy place because I have a covenant of redemption and I exercise my covenant right. And in the name of Jesus, it takes me, it might take me a few years, but I'm coming out of here and I'm going all the way to my wealthy place. I'm redeemed from not having enough. Tell your doctor, Thank you, Doc. I appreciate your wisdom. You know, because Christians, some, some Christians think God is against doctors. God's not against doctors. Take your medication if you have to. Faith must have corresponding action. Don't die in the name of faith and give God a bad name. If your faith is not big enough to bench press cancer, don't take on cancer. You've hardly believed God for a headache. You're going to be another statistic and they'll say, see, we know somebody else who believed God and died. He died because it was like a, like a little child trying to lift a whole hundred pounds. Faith is a muscle. At one point in this ministry, I couldn't believe God for all the things that have to take place in all our, you know, seven locations, in all these cities to build churches and raise up pastors. We were, our faith wasn't there yet. But now our faith is strong. We are about to launch in the United States because we have what? A higher level of faith. And now we are going global. Taking on the world, glory to God. Because our faith can make that thing come to pass. So notice, you have to work according to corresponding action. So you're redeemed from the second death. That's why terrorism doesn't scare us like it scares some of you. Let me, let me preface it by saying this. A lot of you think that the purpose of life is to live long. Longevity has its place, and certainly it's a covenant right. But the purpose of life is not so much to live long as much as it is to fulfill your God-given destiny. The Apostle Paul at 56, 56 years old, Having turned the world upside down, he declared, I have run my race. I have finished my course. 56, how do you say you finished the course? Because the purpose of life is not so much longevity as much as it is the life of God that you cram in your life. Every day be present in the moment. Every day serve the purpose of God in your generation. Every day make a mark that cannot be erased. Every day be like the, the son of God there, right there, Abel, who though he be dead, yet he still speaks. He is dead, but his word is still here. I intend to stand on it so much so that even when I'm dead and gone, my voice will still speak. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll, but, but notice this. Notice this. Uh, you, you are redeemed from the second death. So you don't have to worry about that. 
Now, here is what I want to show you today. You are not trying to get God to do something that he is not fully persuaded of. You must understand that redemption was God's idea. So, it is not your <laughs> initiative. Therefore, don't let anybody condemn you for having the heart to receive. Now, here is what I want to show you be, to, to get this point across. There are three Hebrew words that the Bible uses to describe this transaction of redemption. Because knowing that you've been bought back, that you've been loose from every bond, every addiction, you don't have to be on crack cocaine. You are a free man or woman today. The ownership has changed. You are not the devils. You are the Lord's. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Knowing that God confers value on you, he's exchanged the life of his son for your life. Knowing that the price has been paid, God loved you so much that he killed himself to pay himself. After planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham and Sheffield in the United Kingdom and in Lusaka, Zambia, we invite you to El Shaddai, Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. We meet as a church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, call us on 713-780-0600. Email houston at elshadaitoday.com or log on to our website at www.elshadaitoday.com. Come and discover your destiny and enter into the realm of possibility. Let's look at these three Hebrew words. Number one word used to describe redemption is the word pada, P-A-D-A. This word means an act of substitutionary sacrifice. An act of substitutionary sacrifice. The idea that Christ was your substitute. That, that you can never... You can never qualify by yourself for your righteousness. Isaiah 64 and 6 is as filthy rags. Well, I'm a good person. You mean to tell me God will send me to hell even if I'm a good person? Even at your best, you still fall short of the glory of God. And God needed to substitute a perfect lamb for your life. And tomorrow you're going to see this. It had to be somebody with blood type G, not with blood type A or B or A, B or O. Or, 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 or. Why? Why? Because when Adam fell, he was the son of God. So we needed another son of God. That's why if you deny the immaculate conception that Jesus Christ was conceived of a virgin, you have denied the deity of Christ and therefore invalidated his ability to be a lamb without blemish and without spot. Why? Because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. That's why he somehow set aside and transcended the nature of sin that all of us have participated in through the loins of Adam. But he became our substitute. And because he became our substitute, I'm going to go quickly on this part. Because he became our substitute, that's why I don't believe in no pain, no gain. He was pain that I can gain. That's why I don't believe in, oh, no cross, no crown. He went to the cross so I can have the crown. That's why I don't believe God is out there to get you. God's going to get you. God's going to get you. God's going to get you. You got to go through trouble in order for you to get to your place of prominence. Oh, yes, amen. So now you're looking for trouble. And if you ain't got no trouble, you're going to borrow somebody's trouble because you got to go to the top. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. You got to have the test before you have the morning. Oh, yes, amen. Oh, yes, amen. Oh, yes, amen. And the whole deal is, look, you don't understand the all crux of the matter. Jesus Christ is your substitute. It was a vicarious substitute. It was penal 
substitution. I'll leave that alone. Uh, but, 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 you know, most of you know what the word vicar is, or you think it's a person. But the word vicar literally means somebody who stands in another's place. That's why you have no business as a pastor, if you can't, to be, being a pastor, if you can't stand in people's place without judging them and believing in them and giving them the best opportunity, even when they mess up, you're not the judge, you are to love them through their issues, just like when Adam fell, God did not reject him, God instituted a plan of redemption, but he loved him through the mess. That's what a vicar is, that's what a pastor is. You're not a pastor just because you can preach a sermon and then ruin people's lives because you are afraid what they did will reflect badly on you. No, the unrighteous choices of your children, Christian, even some of you, let me talk to you parents, when your kids, you've raised them up to believe in God and then they go get pregnant. And because you've been so vocal about teenage pregnancies and you know, parading your family as, as the beacon and the standard of, of, of purity and, and, and holiness. And then she gets pregnant. And now on Sunday, like, I can't go to church because my daughter got pregnant. No, no. Get your big self up. Get your little self. Get your tall self, short self, whatever self you are. Get your blessed self and take your blessed assurance to church. You didn't get pregnant. She did. You don't have to be ashamed. And, 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 and here is the other part. Don't let the church forget you ashamed of your own child. Yes, you don't condone what she did, but you don't start fighting your child in order to fit in within the parameters of your brethren. Don't you know they've also got issues? Oh, man. But Jesus Christ is my substitute. I'm redeemed from going through certain things. Hallelujah. You're going to find out tomorrow. He tested death for every man. I'll never die. I've done all the dying I'm ever going to do. So I don't care what terrorism becomes. The, 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 the only thing a terrorist can do for me is hasten, expedite, quicken, accelerate the moment of my meeting face to face with Jesus. And if your greatest desire is to be with the Lord, uh, how, how are they going to scare you by telling you, we're going to cause you to be in the presence of the one you love the most quicker than you thought you would be? If you have no revelation of heaven, that's why you want to stay here. But when you begin to imagine what kind of city that is, when you begin to imagine a, a throne with a sea of crystal in front of it, and thousands upon thousands of angels, and elders and thrones, glory to God, and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, the color of burned bronze. I heard some people say, I'm looking for a black Jesus. I don't need a black Jesus. I don't need a black Jesus. I don't need a white Jesus either. He, you know, some of you take him to your house. He, Come on, Jesus. Let me show you your picture at my house. You know the picture you've hung up right at your house? He's got blue eyes and blonde hair. He says, that's not me. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to laugh today. <laughs> Go right on God. But I don't need a black Jesus. The scripture describes him. You can read for yourself. Can you read? We'll read it to you. I don't care what color he is. What I care about is, can his blood wash away my sins? Can his blood open the door to redemption? And his blood certainly did that. He's my substitute. The second word the Bible uses to describe redemption is the word Gael. G-A-A-L. Glory to God. That is to buy back one's freedom by acting as a kinsman redeemer. To buy back one's freedom by acting as a kinsman redeemer. What does it mean to be a kinsman? It means to be related to you. Hebrews 4 tells us, for we do not have a priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but we have a high priest who himself was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Therefore, he can identify with us. And then he told you, so now you can come boldly to the throne of grace in times of need, so you can obtain mercy and grace. Why? Because if God could not identify with you, he could misunderstand you. Let me tell you, if you never put yourself in another man's shoes, you will always misunderstand them. To you, they'll just be another bunch of delinquent youth. To you, they'll just be a bunch of single parents. To you, they'll just be a bunch of immigrants. To you, they'll just be a bunch of working class. To you, they'll be nothing but parasites and pawn life. 
But until you begin to identify yourself with that kind of people trying to put yourself in another man's shoes, Ezekiel, you are the word of God. And this is what the church does. We want to preach to people. You know, that's why we, 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 most Christians will, will laugh at people like prostitutes and, and, and people having issues with their sexuality or, or stuff like that because they don't identify with them. And what we do is preach to them, but you cannot condemn anybody in the kingdom of, into the kingdom of God. Ezekiel had a word. He says, then I arose there in the valley of Tel Aviv and the spirit of the Lord. I rose up in the heat of my spirit and the spirit of God had, had stirred me up and I was ready to preach to Israel to tell him, how could you backslide after all the things that God did for you? How could you worship idols after all the miraculous signs you've seen? And he says, and then I sat where they sat. And for seven days I couldn't preach to them. Some of you are eloquent, talking about your friend who went through that challenge in their marriage, in their health, and in their finances, because you haven't sat where they sat. It's amazing how your tune will change when you sit where somebody sat. And God said, in all of scripture, it's a principle of redemption. You cannot redeem somebody that you are not keen to, with whom you can't identify. So when he wanted to save Israel from the famine, he raised up a Joseph. When he wanted to deliver, to deliver them, he raised up a Moses. When he wanted to, even, even in, the, in the case of Ruth, they had to look for a Boaz who was keen to Naomi. Because you can't redeem anybody with whom you're, to whom you're not related. And so the book of Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, for this reason, verse 11, he that sanctifies and them that are sanctified are partakers of the same flesh and blood. So that what? So that, so that what? He is now not ashamed to call them his brothers. So now God said, if I'm going to redeem you, I won't send you somebody so detached or an angel. I'll send you my son and he will be touched by the feelings of your infirmities. So in your redemption, you can be sure if nobody, nobody else stands by you. The apostle Paul said, I preached to all these men, but all men forsook me, yet the Lord stood by me. There's somebody you can count on as I close. God will stand by you. He will stand by you through thick and thin. Even in the midst of your own mistakes. Lastly, the word that the Bible talks about to describe redemption is the word kippah, from which we get Yom Kippur. And that is a material transaction by the payment of a ransom. A material transaction through the payment of a ransom. And he said that the Son of Man, Mark 10 and 45, has not come to be, you know, to be served, but he has come to seek and save that which was lost and give his life a ransom for many. And the scripture says in the book of 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, for we have one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Notice, he is the man who stands in the middle and he was given as a ransom for you and me. Why? Because redemption is a legal transaction. Something had to be paid. But, but here is where most people miss it. You think that God paid the devil. That would be to have a theology called dualism. Dualism is the theology that asserts or contends that God and the devil are in some kind of a fight. God and the devil have never been in some kind of fight. When I saw Michael, you know, coming to rescue the angel from the prince of Persia, they were in a fight. That's an angel. Jesus Paul went ahead and said about the belief. The prayers have been held up. That's the Old Testament. Jesus declared, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He has beaten the dust so badly. If you talk about the big bang, there was a big bang, all right. But it ain't what you think. <laughs> but God paid for you. The price has been paid. That means it's illegal for either God or Satan to make you sick. I remember as a business student learning concepts in accounting because the Bible is a legal document and it uses accounting terms. We've been reconciled to God. A few months ago, I preached about being redeemed by the blood of Jesus and I gave you six reasons why that blood is precious. That blood is precious because of its reconciling power. That blood is precious because of its redeeming power. 
That blood is precious. Glory to God because of its pacifying power. That blood is precious because of its song inspiring power. But that blood of Jesus is precious because it obligates God to not do certain things. There's a material transaction involved. If God has to make you sick, when Isaiah 53 and verse 10 in the Amplified says he made him sick, that means God cannot balance the books. And the language of reconciliation is the language of making sure whatever you take from the debit side, you credit to, you put on the credit side, otherwise your books will not balance. Hello, accountants. If God took sickness out of Jesus, he must credit healing to you. If the punishment that brought you peace was laid upon him, if he took the punishment, then he must credit peace, shalom to you. If he was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities, then you mustn't be wounded and you mustn't be what? Bruised. So if you're waiting for God to bruise you, it's too late. Because here is the thing you must understand as I close. When Jesus was on the cross, God was working in Christ, but he wasn't working on Christ. Oh, you're going to see this as we go along. And the language of identification. That's why everything the gospel said about Jesus, Paul went ahead and said about the believer. After planting eight successful churches in London, Bradford, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff, Nottingham and Sheffield in the United Kingdom and in Lusaka, Zambia, we invite you to El Shaddai Houston. Come and be a part of a charismatic, global and faith-filled revolution that is set to make a mark in your life that can never be erased. We meet as a church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at 5633 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas, 77057. For more information, call us on 713-780-0600. Email houston at elshadaitoday.com or log on to our website at www.elshadaitoday.com. Come and discover your destiny and enter into the realm of possibility. Thank you for watching Get Understanding. For information about our ministries or to download our free podcasts, visit us at www.elshaddaitoday.com.